Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Inspirations. All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His aid, and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evils of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped, but Allah alone who has no partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations. In this show we are still trying our best to live with the Prophet ﷺ and his companions to try to take some, some, take some time out from our daily life, from our da daily uh, business and try to travel through time back to the time or the era of Muhammad ﷺ and his companions, the golden age of Islam, the most excellent and the most impressive generation that ever lived on earth from all religions and throughout uh, the ages. That was the best time humanity has ever experienced in terms of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fulfilling the purpose for which humanity was created and also in terms of uh, personal success and, per and success on the, na on the level of the nation as a whole. So hopefully we will be able to take this beautiful example after we manage to understand it and uncover some of the beautiful secrets that led them to such a marvelous and wonderful and phenomenal uh, difference that they have managed to make in their lives and the lives of humanity at large. We came to the point where Ali ibn Abi Talib was one day at home sitting and he had a slave uh, girl, a female slave girl, a maid, a servant female servant, she came, she rushed actually to Ali ibn Abi Talib, saying to him, have you heard that Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, has been, uh, somebody asked for her hand in marriage? He said, no, I didn't hear about that. She said, why didn't you go to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and ask for, your ha for her hand? Why didn't you marry Fatima? She's the best choice for you. She's the be she would be the, w the best wife for you. He said, but I, I don't have anything to present or to give it as a dowry. So how can I approach the Prophet ﷺ regarding that? She said, you just go to the Prophet ﷺ and I'm sure he will give her to you. He will allow you to marry her. Ali ibn Abi Talib carried himself, pulled himself all together and uh, managed to put his carriage all together and went to the Prophet ﷺ. He knocked on the door he was given permission to go in. He went in and he sat with the Prophet ﷺ who was with Zayd ibn Haritha, who at that time was called Zayd ibn Muhammad. He was considered to be the adopted son of Muhammad ﷺ. And by the way, Zayd ibn Haritha comes from an African origin. So he was a black man. Ali ibn Abi Talib walked in and he sat with the Prophet ﷺ, gave salam and sat down. He said, I wanted to speak to the Prophet ﷺ about that. I wanted to tell him about my intention and my desire to marry Fatima. But he said, I couldn't because the Prophet ﷺ was such a great person and you could feel the greatness, so you won't dare ask him something like that. So he said, I sat there embarrassed. The Prophet ﷺ looked at Ali ibn Abi Talib and I will let Ali ibn Abi Talib himself narrate this story. He said, I sat down consumed by embarrassment, I was so shy because I felt so much respect towards the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger 
looked at me and he said, What did you come for? Do, do you need anything? I didn't speak. I said, No, 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 there's nothing. For the second time, the Prophet Sallallahu said to him, Ya Ali, why did you come here? Do you have anything to request? Do you have any wish? He said, My fear, my embarrassment did not allow me or did not give me enough courage to speak to the Prophet Sallallahu and request or ask the hand of Fatima. So he said, I said, no, no, I didn't come to ask for anything. So the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and smiled and said, haven't you come to ask for the hand of Fatima in marriage? And that was such a wonderful moment. Obviously for Ali ibn Abi Talib, it's a wonderful moment for us to learn from. It just gives you an impression or gives you some kind of an image of an insight. What kind of person our great Prophet ﷺ was? He could tell what Ali came for. Because he knew Ali ibn Abi Talib and he knew that Ali ibn Abi Talib had the intention because he knows his people. The Prophet ﷺ had a sense of intuition, a deep sense of intuition. He could tell what people really, most of the time he could tell what people had in their hearts, what intention they had. And that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is given to people who are sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and he said, haven't you come to ask for the hand of Fatima in marriage? So you could imagine what the response of Ali, of Ali ibn Abi Talib was. He, wa he really came for that purpose. He couldn't speak it out, out of embarrassment, out of shyness. Yet the Prophet ﷺ made it easy for him. He was behaving to the Muslims as a very caring and loving father, as a compassionate father who really cared for uh, the welfare of his followers, the welfare of his companions. So he said, he smiled in a fatherly manner. Didn't you come to ask for the hand of Fatima in marriage? And even Abu Talib, with all embarrassment, said, yes indeed. The Messenger said to him, so what do you have to offer? What do you have to offer to Fatima? Because we know it's the man's, it's the husband's responsibility to offer a dowry. That's his responsibility, that's his obligation. He has to make it. And this actually explains why some of the rules of inheritance are made in certain cases, cases where the male takes a greater portion than the female. Now I know many enemies of Islam, many people who are ignorant about Islam, they don't know enough about Islam, they just uh, move or they, uh, they go with the tide or they ride the tide and they speak things about Islam they have no knowledge, no proper knowledge about. So we say to those and to the Muslims, be confident that when a ruling or when a judgment comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows everything, the one who created us, then Allah knows why He gives people different proportions. So Allah's, all the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stipulated, all the sharia that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down to us, it's for our own benefit in the first place. Not only in the next world, but even in this life. Imam ibn al-Qayyim has a very beautiful statement when he says, he explains one of the verses in Surah Al-Infitar, one of the surahs in Juz Amma, in the final juz of the Qur'an, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٌ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٌ Indeed, the righteous ones, the believing servants, live in ecstasy and happiness and tranquility. And the fujjar, the evildoers, the wrongdoers, the disbelievers, live in a state of torment, agony, and uh, misery. Imam Al-Qayyim says, anyone who thinks that this only talks about the hereafter, then he's wrong. Indeed, the believers in Al-Abrara Lafi Naim, the righteous ones, are in a state of happiness, tranquility, in this world, in the grave, and in paradise. And in al fujjara lafi jahim, the evil doers, the disbelievers, are in a state of pain, agony, and torment in this life, in the grave, and in the hereafter, in hellfire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this sharia to us in order to set everything right because He created us and He knows what's best for us. Allah says in Surah Al A'raf, to Allah belong the creation and the legislation. So Allah created them fully compatible and in a perfect state of harmony. So any law we come up with, 
will not suit the human nature and will create so many problems. This is something we have to understand. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, the Messenger ﷺ asked him, what do you have to offer her as a dowry? Don't you have anything? He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I don't have anything. I'd like to go back to the atmosphere with that very uh, incident that happened, that how the Prophet ﷺ spoke to him in a very fatherly manner. He said, uh, haven't you come to ask for the hand of Fatima in marriage? Ali ibn Abi Talib, with all the embarrassment, he said, yes, O oh, Messenger of Allah. Straight away, the Prophet ﷺ asked him, what do you have to offer her in dowry? And that was, that's a very compassionate and loving way of asking this question. And Ibn Abi Talib said, by Allah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have nothing to offer her. The Messenger ﷺ did not take that for granted and say, well, you can't marry her. Simply, he was trying to help Ali ibn Abi Talib. He came to Ali, he said, just said, said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, what happened to an armor? You know, the armor that they were during the battle. He said, what happened to an armor that I gave you a while ago? He said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I've got it, but it's worth nothing. It's worthless. You know, it, it, the value of it is not suitable for a dowry. He said, listen, th this is the kind of in, inner, inner conversation Oh, in a, uh, this is the, the way Ali ibn Abi Talib was speaking to himself. There was an inner conversation. He said, it's worth nothing. This arm, it's worth maybe four dirham, which is worthless. It's not suitable to be presented as a dowry to Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So I said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I've got it. The Prophet said to, said to him, okay, Fatima is yours. You will marry Fatima, but send this armor to her so she can maybe sell it or you know, make benefit of, uh, just benefit from its value. So send it to Fatima and she will be your wife. Such a wonderful and beautiful aspect of the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So Ali ibn, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib was married to Fatima. Such a beautiful and blessed marriage by, uh, that was consented and was uh, given permission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the whole of Medina was very happy that the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ got married to his nephew, Ali, uh, uh, also to his cousin, sorry, Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he married, Ali ibn Abi Talib married Fatima in a very wonderful and beautiful mar marriage. And during this time, during the times of marriage, the Prophet ﷺ instructed the Muslims to display the happiness, to enjoy these times. Because these are times of happiness. As the people who take the wrong way, the wrong path, they enjoy and they display their joy over, over wrong things, over evil things. We have more right to display our happiness in a moderate manner, in a suitable manner, about the happy occasions that we happen to have during this life. So the Prophet ﷺ instructed the, the Muslims generally in such occasions. He said, the line between an illegal relationship between a man and a woman and a legal relationship, legal marriage, is to announce that, announce that marriage by letting the little girls use the drum or the hand drum, which is a duff, and they sing and they enjoy their time. And the men can listen over to that, to the little girls. Because many people sometimes misinterpret the word jariya. They think jariya in Arabic means a, grown, a fully grown woman. No, Jariya means a little girl that has not reached puberty. You're talking about seven years, eight years, maybe up to ten years. Depends. As long as the girl has not reached marriage, she's called Jariya. So these are the girls. These are the only category that are allowed to use the duff. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ never used it, by the way, as men, because that was a shame. Even Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, says... Uh, uh, he says the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never, uh, they never clapped their hands, they never applauded anyone, okay, or they never applauded to anything, and they never hit with their hand a hand drum or a daf. Then Ibn Taymiyyah says, and nobody does that apart from people whose manhood whose mas masculine nature has been scratched severely, people who are actually not real men. So this is an etiquette, that, and there is a, a similar report reported from Imam Malik, 
the Imam of Al Madinah, may Allah have mercy on them both. So, in such occasions, the Prophet ﷺ instructed the believers to enjoy such occasions in a good manner. So, where the little girls use the hand drum and they can sing as long as the words are good and sound, they can, the little girls can sing that and the men can listen to that, they can hear it, no problem with that, and they can enjoy it. Actually, the Prophet ﷺ one day was passing by a wedding party where the little girls were, were singing and using the hand drum. And they were saying, listen to the words, they were saying, نَحْنُ جَوَارٍ مِنْ بَنِ النَّجَّارِ يَا حَبَّذَا مُحَمَّدٌ مِنْ جَارِ They said, we are little girls from the tribe or the faction of Banu Najjar. What a great neighbor we have. He is Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ looked at them and he said, Allah knows how much my heart loves you. So this is, it just shows how Medina was full with happiness over this marriage. They enjoyed this uh, occasion and uh, there was obviously a walima as the Prophet ﷺ instructed where there was a feast where people gathered together and they enjoyed the food together just to celebrate and to show and to express the happiness of wonderful occasions because humans need such occasions because life is full of ups and downs and we are allowed to enjoy the happy occasions moderately according to the guidelines of Al-Islam. Now different things happened within the society of Al-Medina. We will find out about that inshallah after the short break. Stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. The Muslims in particular will I have very good knowledge of Islamic religion and Islamic law and then will run their lives according to the injunctions of Allah. It will enable them to know how to live peacefully with them and at the same time practice Islamic religion or follow the injunctions of Allah as requested and required by the Allah. <laughs> Just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. So the people of Medina were happy, the Muslims particularly, were very happy about the marriage of Ali ibn Abi Talib to Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They enjoyed it. And it was a very happy occasion, especially after the battle of Badr. And the way the Prophet ﷺ made it easy for Ali to marry Fatima was a very good example for all Muslims to show them that it's not about wealth. Marriage is not about wealth. If you have a daughter or a sister, a sister you're in charge of, the criterion that you use to choose a husband for her is not wealth. It's not the social status. It's faith, it's Iman. Even if the person is poor, as long as this person possesses the right traits of a husband that are acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to marry that person if your daughter is happy with him as her husband. So this is a very profound lesson. And this actually, this should draw our attention to one way of, one aspect of leadership. How leaders manage to teach the people under their leadership by example, not only by instruction. Because many times, and this is something human, humans tend to believe what they see more than what they hear. So you can lecture for a few hours on one subject and still many people would not buy into that. But if you uh, practice that in front of people, you, you become a role model or an example, you will find that the percentage will be higher. More people will tend to follow that example because people tend to believe what they see more than what they hear. We can put it differently, but we say that the sight is more credible with the brain than the ears. So we tend to believe what we see. We tend to be more convinced with that more than what we hear. This is why the very famous proverb or the very 
famous statement came that actions speak louder than words. And that was exactly how the Prophet ﷺ used to teach his companions. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave a very good and great example. We will see inshallah in the future how this affected the Muslims in the, uh, when it comes to marriage. Uh, Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her, and Ali ibn Abi Talib as well, may Allah be pleased with him. They were a very poor family. If you look, look into their house, if you try to see any sign of extravagance, any, sign, any signs of even basic needs, you could only find very little. And likewise was the house of the Prophet ﷺ. But despite poverty, they were rich in something far greater than the material richness that people uh, seek after. The house was rich with Iman. The house was rich with love. Imagine a house where people are very wealthy, they're well off, they, they live a very extravagant life, they have all the material possessions you could imagine, and yet there is no harmony, no mutual understanding between wife and husband. You can tell that such a house is hell to live in. And you could imagine on the other side, a house that is very poor, that has only the basic needs for living, or maybe even some of the basics, some of the basics are not there. But you see the house full with love, full with mutual understanding, full with compassion and care, and full with iman, contentment with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second house has much more happiness than the first one. So it's not about the material gains, not about the material possessions. It's more about the meaning of this life, understanding what this life is all about. This Iman strengthens the family and paves the way for a happy, constructive and successful family. So this was the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima. This was the house of the Prophet sallallahu You know, one day Umar ibn Khattab came to the house of the Messenger sallallahu The Messenger, peace be upon him, was lying on his side on a straw mat. The Prophet ﷺ sat up in order to speak to Umar ibn Khattab, being his guest. Ali, Umar ibn Khattab, sorry, Umar ibn Khattab looked at the Prophet ﷺ, and then he, his eyes were in tears. He was touched by that. He saw that the straw mat made signs on the side of the Prophet ﷺ, on his skin. The Prophet ﷺ looked at Umar ibn Khattab and he said, What makes you cry, Umar ibn Khattab? He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you are the best among the creation. You are the Messenger of Allah. You are the Prophet. And you are living in such a condition. You're living a life of poverty. Whereas the kings of Persia, the Romans and the Byzantine Empire, they live in extreme extravagance, unbelievable. The Prophet ﷺ looked at him and he said, Umar al-Khattab, aren't you satisfied that Allah will give us the blessings of the hereafter, the blessings of paradise? And these people enjoy themselves as much as they want in this life? We're not after this life. We are after the next. That's the real life. This is only a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us here in this life and He tested us with hardship and poverty and with goodness and with extravagance in order to see how we react and how we behave towards that. Are we respons Are we going to behave in, in a, with a sense of responsibility to the reality of our life, to the reality of this universe? Or are we only going to enjoy, be short-sighted and only worry about enjoying ourselves? ourselves? in the sense of the temporary life. The reality of this life is that it's a test. It is a test and we have to pass it. Whether hardship comes to us or an easy life comes to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see how we will react to that. And this actually makes the believer, makes the Muslims proactive, that we understand, we deal with the reality of this life. The temporary things have very little impact on our behavior. We are flexible with the temporary circumstances. But deep in our hearts, deep inside our character, right at the center of our characters, we deal with the reality, with the universal truths, with the timeless truths about this world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. We understand the greatness of Allah. We understand His names, His attributes. We understand why He created this universe, why He created us. What's the purpose behind that? We understand how this world came about. 
and we understand what's the point behind the creation. We understand what we are supposed to do, to do here in this life. And we understand where we will end up, we, where we will go. And we know that there will, we will be responsible. We will be questioned about our attitude, about our behavior, about the way we choose to lead our lives in this world. We will be questioned about that. These are the realities, the timeless realities, the changes, changeless realities that are the underlying truths of this universe. These form the base of our character. So this makes us very proactive. No matter what happens to us, we have light. We know how to deal with this life. We know what's the meaning of this hardship. It doesn't throw us off balance. No. Because right in our center, in our hearts, in the center of our lives, we deal with changeless realities, changeless truths that give us the strength and the power and the persistence to lead through this life no matter what hardships are, no matter how difficult or no matter how hard the circumstances we are facing are, we will still remain dealing with absolute truths that never change. If the weather changes, if the prices change, if the markets change, if our financial situation changes, if our uh, even emotional situation changes, if our uh, family uh, or social conditions change, our insight doesn't change because we deal with timeless truths, the truths the subtle truth that govern this world, that can work and can function in all ages, in all places, and under all conditions. This is what the Muslims deal with, and this is how we should be as Muslims. But if we were to talk about the reality of the Muslims today, most of us are unaware of that. We have so much power, so much energy and strength in our Iman, in our faith, but we don't put it in action. We don't, we don't allow it to function in our lives. We're still so much committed, so much uh, uh, attracted to the material things, the material pleasures of this world. So we have to think seriously about what we already possess. And this was the case of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. Despite all the poverty, all the hardships, they were confident Muslims. They knew their course of action and they knew where they were heading and they led a wonderful life of responsibility, of success, achievement, and a life of mission. So this, this is why they were the best generation ever raised for mankind. And this is how we should try to be. This should be our goal and our aim. So the Prophet ﷺ lived most of his time a life of poverty. Most of the companions the same. They knew their message. Even when they, the message of Islam spread around the world, and they became so rich, so wealthy. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they remained the same. It didn't change them. The attitude never changed. The sense of mission never changed. The responsibility to the rest of humanity never changed. So this is how we want to be, because inside them, in the hearts, there's a powerful Iman powerful faith that never changes because it's linked to the changeless truths about this world, about existence and about the reality of who we are and what we are supposed to do in this life. Now, most of the people of Medina were happy with the marriage of Ali ibn Abi Talib to Fatima. May Allah be pleased with them all. Except for some people, some individuals who were there, and they were smiling, they pretended to be happy about that marriage, but they were not. Because after the Battle of Badr, and be, we know that before the Battle of Badr, there were non-Muslims in Medina. So many people were still living upon shirk, upon polytheism, disbelief. And the greatest or the most one, uh, known one of them, who was somehow their leader, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Now after the Muslims have established themselves as one of the... Uh, strongest powers in the Arabian Peninsula after defeating Quraysh in the Battle of Badr, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul realized that he could not remain as he was, a disbeliever. 
So in order to gain more popular, popularity, and in order not to lose the position that he was still has managed to maintain so far in Medina, he decided to join or to pretend to join the believers. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ with some of his followers and they gave bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ. But inside there were still non-Muslims. But they were pretending because they realized that this is a, best, a better course of action. It was all about politics. There were proper spin doctors at that time. They were lying. They would just evaluate where their worldly benefit is and they would do whatever it takes in order to get to their goals, even if it meant that they would lie, scheme, plot, deceive, betray, everything. They had nothing to, they had no true aqidah, no true faith or iman to stop them from doing these evil things. So they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they pretended to be believers. The Messenger ﷺ knew the reality because Allah told him about that. So the Prophet ﷺ knew about that. But still, out of the wisdom of the Messenger ﷺ, he did not treat them as disbelievers. He treated them as believers according to what he saw from them. Because if the Messenger ﷺ were to open the way for people to try and deal with others based on their intuition, based on what's in the, because we don't have access to people's hearts, the Prophet ﷺ had access by means of Allah telling him. So the Prophet ﷺ knew and he understood that he was a role model, he was an example. So if he were to treat people based on what's in our hearts, people would start making conjecture, they would start guessing what's in people's hearts and then deal with them based on that. No, we treat people based on their apparent behavior, based on their words. They said, they pretended to be Muslims, okay, we deal with you based on what you Show us, based on what we see, based on your actions, on your words. As to what's in the hearts, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that deals with that. So this is a beautiful and important lesson we have to learn. We don't treat people based on how we guess what's in their hearts, or we think this is in your heart. I know what you, why you did this, this and that. Because in your heart, you, want to do, you, you wanted to get something. We don't treat people like that. We take people for their words and their actions. If they tell us we did it in order to, you know, for a certain goal, we take that. Thank you. But if we see discrepancy, if we contra see contradiction in their words and their actions, then we bring that to light and we question people about it. And this is very important in the way we deal with our children. We have to build trust. One of the best ways of cultivating, of raising our children is to trust them. Show them that we trust them, even if they lie. Don't treat them as if you know what's in their hearts. Your child comes to you and he says, okay, you ask your child, did you break that, uh, for example, did you break that piece of furniture or that glass? Did you break it? He would say to you, no, I didn't do it. Take that word from your child, even if he's lying or if she's lying. Take it from them and you, then you can treat it. If they were lying, it will show, it will be apparent because you will see discrepancy in their, in their story, inconsistency, you will see inconsistency in the story. Ask them to tell you what happened, you will see the inconsistency, inconsistency in the story and you can tell that they were lying. But if your child comes to you and says something, don't say, uh, I, I know this is not true. You will be destroying the mutual trust that you have with your child. And actually, your relationship with your child will deteriorate drastically. That's a very serious thing. Deal with your child based on what you see and you hear. Don't start making judgments about what's in their hearts. Because actually, they might be telling the truth, but you missed something around in the, in the incident, and you arrived at the wrong conclusion. And if you keep doubting what your child tells you, what will happen, you will be destroying their own self-confidence, their own self-esteem. And this is a problem that we have in the Muslim world. We grow up and we become the, the men and the women who run the society. But if you verify with a very careful and a very, uh, uh, very careful eye, with scrutiny, if you look at people's character, you can tell. 
that most of the people don't have se proper self-esteem. They either have low self-esteem or they have arrogance. And both of them are very destructive. So this is something that we can learn from the Prophet ﷺ. Take the people for what they say. Accept what they say and what they do and treat them based on that. Don't try to play smart. Don't try to be smart so that you know what's in their hearts. If they conceal something in their hearts, don't worry. It will show in their actions and in their words. So wait for that moment where you can tell the discrepancy or the contradiction in their actions and their words and then you can ask them to explain. And things will go in the right direction, inshaAllah. So we can see that the Prophet ﷺ was a very wise man. And we can actually take so much wisdom from the way he conducted his affairs, his affairs on a personal level. And even with his companions. And even on the level of state and the, state, and the level of uh, international relations as we will come to see, inshaAllah. So we are all invited to benefit from this wonderful example, from this wonderful man. That the more we study about his life, the more love we have for him. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us follow his example. Now inshallah we have much more to talk about. This wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu and the beautiful example of his companions. Uh, so you are all invited to remain with us. Stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ have informed us that we should not obey no one on the account of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the superiority is to Allah's command. So if the husband tells his wife that I want you to check hands with my colleagues, with my business partners, no, even if it leads to divorce. If the husband says to his wife that you have to party with me, with partners and so on, no, you have to take your hijab off, no. By any mean, communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your language and He will be very happy to answer your prayer. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. And uh, before I go back to the beautiful air or the beautiful atmosphere there in Medina, I would like to remind you to write to us on our email address, which is inspirations at huda.tv. Again, our email address is inspirations at huda.tv. All your emails are welcome. And I really thank those, uh, the viewers who are, MashaAllah, very consistent in writing to us. I really thank them so much. And I apologize for our shortcomings in replying to you. But it's just so much work that needs to be done. And sometimes we don't get to give you the right or the, uh, an answer that we are satisfied with. So this is why you get our emails or our responses sometimes delayed. So please be patient with us. But all your emails, uh, inshallah, will be uh, taken seriously. And we do benefit from them. And I really thank you because I receive so many questions, so many comments sometimes, things that really add to the show. And we do benefit from that. And it gives us some kind, some sense or some kind of an indicator how much our uh, viewers benefit from the show. So if you have felt that the show had an impact, uh, positive impact, please let us know about that. Positive impact on yourself, on your... Uh, the w on your personality, your character, or anything in your life, please let us know. And I would like that our viewers, if you really learn what we say very well, I would like you to try to utilize that in social gatherings. When you sit with your family, sit with relatives, anybody that you know, your cousins, your in-laws, try to bring something from the seerah into the discussion. Try to discuss it with them. Try to relate a story and try to take lessons from that. So we make even our social life centered around our message in this world, centered around our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the messengers, we just talked about how uh, hypocrisy emerged. Those non-Muslims in Medina, they pretended that they have become Muslims, that they have chosen Islam, but in reality they were not. And we saw so much wisdom how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dealt with them. 
So hypocrites now will play a very destructive role in the society of Al Medina, but we will see how the great wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ in handling those people and how the companions, because when you have so much Iman, when you live for, the, for a purpose that you have identified very well, for a noble purpose, that is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and carrying the message of Al Islam, nothing can stop you. Even the evil elements, the negative elements in the society will not be able to hinder you. You will be able to make it to your goal. So we will try to understand how we can utilize that and implement it in our daily life. Uh, something else in the Muslim society that really marked a very beautiful aspect of that beautiful society, those beautiful people, was the Messenger ﷺ one day was giving the khutbah and he said to the Muslims, my advice to you, anyone who has alcohol, anyone who has, ta has because at that time, people were still drinking alcohol. By the way, companions at that time, Many of them were still drinking alcohol. They would even, you know, gather together in somebody's house and get drunk. That was a very normal thing because still up to that time, so far, uh, alcohol was still lawful. Nothing was sent down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to state that it has become prohibited. So companions used to drink, buy and sell alcohol. Actually, it constituted a, constituted a huge portion of the trade of that time. The Arab trade in the Arabian Peninsula, all of it. Alcohol was very popular. People liked it so much. They used to get, most of the people used to get drunk almost every day. So it was, because it uh, was very deep in their social life. So the Prophet ﷺ, one day when he was giving the khutbah, he said to the Muslims, anyone who has alcohol, Make use of it. You either sell it, you give it as a gift, you drink it, okay? Because it seems Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reveal something with regards to alcohol. So make use of what you have now as long as it's halal. It is still halal. So make use of it. One person, I'm not sure, I, I made a research and tried to find out whether he was Muslim at that time or not. But I couldn't find... In the, in the sources of the seerah, anything that specifies whether he was Muslim or not. But there was a person called Malik ibn al-Nadr. Malik ibn al-Nadr is the father of the great companion Anas ibn al-Nadr. Anas ibn al-Nadr was Muslim, obviously. His mother was uh, Muslim, uh, Umm Sulaim. But his father, I'm not sure if he was Muslim, but he did something very bad. When the, after this khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ about alcohol, when he said, uh, make use of it, sell it, you know, drink it, uh, give it as a gift, don't, okay, just do away with it, because it seems that Allah will send a new ruling regarding uh, alcohol. This man felt uneasy when he heard that, Malik ibn al-Nadr. So he went to his wife, he said, you know, this man, he's talking about Muhammad Sallallahu This man, it seems that he's feeling, you know, very impatient when it comes, he's getting very impatient when it comes to alcohol. And I can't live without it. It's, I have the intuition, I have a sense that he is going to make it prohibited. And if he does so, I will not be able to live without it. So, this is why I'm still doubtful. Was he Muslim or not? Because it's not a way to talk about the Prophet Sallallahu in the first place. The second thing, it seems that he will have to comply with the rulings of Islam. So this is why I have this, kind of, this confusion. But anyway, this doesn't really uh, matter so much in this story. What he said to his wife, I, I don't think I will be able to live without alcohol. And if Muhammad makes it forbidden, that will be a very serious thing to me. I don't think I can live without it. So what he did, he decided to leave his wife and leave his son, Anas ibn Malik and leave the whole of Medina. Why? For the sake of alcohol. Imagine how alcohol destroyed that family. He preferred alcohol for his wife, his child, his home, his life. That's, Medina was his hometown. This is where he was born, he was raised, and he lived all his life in Medina. He decided to leave it. Why? For the sake of alcohol. You see when someone's desires overcome him and take control over him? 
So he decided to leave Medina. He went to Asham and he died there in natural Syria, which is to the north of the Arabian Peninsula. No problem to Umm Sulaim and her son, Anas ibn al-Nadr, because they were still upon Islam. And they decided to remain upon Islam. And they let that man go to where, whatever, wherever he wants to go. Because Islam is far greater than our desires or our addiction to alcohol or smoking or whatever. And this, there is a clear message here and a very important message to those who are addicted to alcohol, those who are addicted to drugs, those who are addicted even to smoking. It can push you out of Islam. I don't say that a sin will make you fall into kufr. No. These are the statements of Al-Khawarij. But what we say that if the love for these things overcome your heart, when it comes to a moment where you have to choose, it's very likely you will choose these things over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and over Islam. And this is a serious matter. So this is why we have to make sure that we always keep our lives and our even the things that we like, our desires, we have to keep them under the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We only love the things that are permissible for us. And we give everything its true weight when it comes to the worldly matters. So basically this was the case of, uh, this was generally the case in al Medina. The uh, hypocrites, yes, they pretended to be happy with Islam, happy with the Prophet Sallallahu but deep inside, in their hearts, there, were, there was a fire burning everything inside. They were hoping that something could come and destroy Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions. An army from nowhere could come and just kill them and annihilate them and finish them off. They wished for that. And one day, some news came to Medina that made the hypocrites rejoice and feel happy or, uh, and feel some, some, somehow uh, optimistic about their dreams that Islam would come to an end. What was that? The news actually came from Mecca. And it put the Muslims in a state of shock. Somehow they were in a state of shock. Actually, the people of Mecca were planning to take revenge. They were determined actually to avenge their people who died or who were killed in the Battle of Badr. And that was one year and one month after the Battle of Badr. So it it's, was about 13 months after the Battle of Badr. What was the story? This is, this is something, inshallah, we will try to find out when we meet next time. So you are all invited to join us next week. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us. So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirit